So everybody, welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. Um, we're happy to have today with us Jeff Verlast from Smalls um, to talk about the Belgian e-government's journey to um, the cloud and to OpenShift. So um, I'm going to let Jeff do all of the talking and introduce himself in a minute. If you have Q&A, what we're going to do today is we're going to let Jeff give his presentations for 20, 25 minutes. And um, then after that, you can ask your questions in the chat room. Um, and for follow-ups, I'll just unmute you. And your Q&A um, will get recorded as well. So without further ado, Jeff, um, let's let's hear about what's going on in Belgium in the e-government today. Yeah, thank you, Diane. So I'm Chef uh, Verelst, uh, architect at Smalls, and uh, responsible for getting a part of the Belgian e-government to a platform as a service. So today I'm not going to present you a lot of technical stuff, but we are going to, to tell you a bit what were the reasons for, for getting there, uh, the journey that we have done so far, and, and what we are doing at the moment. So let me first introduce uh, Smalls as, a, as an enterprise to let you know what we are doing and, and why we, we got to, to OpenShift. So Smalls is an uh, in-house ICT provider for the Belgian government. We do different stuff. We do software development, um, custom development, uh, uh, analysis, everything. Uh, on the other hand, we have our own data centers in which we offer infrastructure to our members, uh, not only the infrastructure, but also the operations 24-7. And some of these uh, public institutions require um, skilled personnel, and there we have a staffing solution. So the main idea of having such an in-house service provider is creating a cost-sharing model. So we are a non-for-profit organization. And we try to deliver this uh, cost-sharing by applying technical standards for all institutions. If we work together, we can apply some economies of scale. We can reuse code. And very important, uh, if the project is gone, the people remain in-house, so we retain our expertise. So we are a part of uh, the government. We're mainly focused on social security services and also a lot of healthcare stuff. So what we create as services are things like child allowance, unemployment, the, the health insurance, everything like uh, vacation, pension, uh, all those services are treated by our programs, our data centers. Um, we are not a recent company. We were founded in 1939, so we are already delivering these services for uh, 75 years. We're not the most uh, known company in Belgium, but we can say that every Belgian has is somewhere in our systems because in the complete life cycle of a person, they come into contact with the solutions that we provide. So we are government. But also in the government, there are a lot of challenges in IT today. So there is a very strong pressure on the budget, not only the IT budgets, but also uh, a lot of business um, budgets are under pressure. And so they are looking for IT solutions to, to help them out. So for us, that means doing more with less money. We have a lot of mission-critical applications. One of the examples is uh, we have one for donor organs. So if that one is down, really some lives are at stake. So when we are going through these budget cuts, we still have to remain uh, operational at a high level. And of course, because all of the data that we treat is highly confidential, we are talking about income, about medical state, privacy is for us very important. So if we want to improve our efficiency on that, we think we have to do that by increasing the collaboration a bit a bit more than we were already doing. Uh, and for that, we as Smalls are participating in a larger um, government, um, larger government community cloud that is being built, the Smalls, uh, the Belgian G Cloud. So that one is really uh, a complete solution where we are offering infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, what we are going to present today, and also a lot of software as a service offerings. So let's have a look on how we came to, to go to platform as a service, and then more specifically also with an open source stack. Well, in 2014, we had a very traditional infrastructure, which was based on, on WebLogic 10. WebLogic 10, which 
we needed to migrate from, for technical reasons, it was getting end of life. So we had a, a very large task ahead of us. And we first had a look at, okay, what are our business needs before we started to uh, do technical migrations and taking decisions. And like I said, we are an in-house shared service provider for institutions that are uh, very linked to us. We, we know them very well. But in fact, you can also compare us with this car manufacturing plant. Because if you want to get um, a service operational in this traditional infrastructure, what you had to do was you had to take a lot of different steps before you saw any results. And all those different steps, they were performed in sequence, so it could take some time. And all these steps were rather complicated. So this means they had to be done by a specialist. But that was not that much of a problem, but of course we are flexible, we can handle that. You can pick whatever model that you like, as long as it's in our catalog. And you can tailor your uh, solution at your, your needs. You can pick any color that you want, as long as it's black. And we started to, to feel that, okay, standardization, of course it is important to, to get the efficiency, but sometimes we got the impression that, yeah, if everything you got is a hammer, then the, your problems better look like a nail. Uh, so we wanted to, to make sure, are we tackling the, the correct problem? So our solution may be best, best in class. Yeah, it was when we created it, our uh, infrastructure at the moment, like the, the Model T. But in the meantime, the world is changing. So the customers, they want all these fancy features like windscreens and airbags and safety belts. And we can do that because we are flexible. So we started to optimize our processes and we did some custom autom automation. And that is working fine. But the result is something like this. You can still see it's a Model T. We have added a lot of uh, flexibility into it. But as you can imagine, this is not the most industrialized solution. We can't repeat that very often. It's more, uh, more a one-off. So we sense that we had to do something differently. So what were the non-functional needs that, that we gathered with our customers? Customers said, yeah, but you, you know my business. It's, it's easy. It just has to be fast. And then you talk with another customer, and he says, no, no, you know my business. It just has to look sweet. And then you talk with another, and he says, no, 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 for me, capacity. Capacity is everything. And you talk to a, a fourth one, and he says, no, for me, capacity is everything. And then you say, yeah, but that's still kind of different to what the other guy was telling us. So we had a lot of different non-functional needs that we have had to cater to. Luckily, they do agree on some things, security and reliability, that is clear. Everyone, everybody agrees on that. And there is even one topic that they really, really agree upon, and that's the price. So we ended up with the conclusion that if we are just going to replace our application server, that won't give us all these things all this change that, that we needed. And we were very reluctant to create another factory of a, another car factory of a new model that in the end would not be flexible enough. So our solution that we needed was really something that is from the beginning ready for change, that still remains reliable, and of course is cost efficient. And because we have these legal security requirements, we had to be able to deploy it on premise. And we knew from the start that if we want to make this a success, we would also have to modify our processes. So in the end, we ended up with OpenShift Enterprise version 2. And as I, I said, only installing the product was not going to do it. We needed a mindset shift. So before we were very machine oriented, you had to specify in which DMZ you had to, to put it, what is the name, what is the IP address, but in the end, it's just the applications, the services that, that are what our customers want. That's the only thing that they see. So we had to, to shift to application-oriented. Because we were machine-oriented, all our environments had the risk of being different, which means that if you test it in development and then you put it in production because it's a different environment, you have no guarantee whatsoever that it works. 
So we wanted to have these, these container environments that we are sure that if we test it in development, in production, it's exactly the same. We don't want to create a lot of processes with a lot of tools like we had before. We want to have a simple self-contained application so that we could install it 100% automated. And 100% automated means no more manual interventions because with these manual interventions, somebody can make a typo, can forget something, it isn't done. No, it should be zero touch deployment. Once the deployment is created, nobody touches it and it installs completely automatically. If you want to change anything, you redeploy. We also wanted to get away from the one enterprise-wide solution that needs to fit all the needs. Instead, we created a standard solution, but with room for extension. So this room for extension allows us to be flexible, but it also meant that because we now have standard solutions with room for extension, which is self-contained, that we couldn't work anymore with a development team that only looks at the, the program, the middleware team that configures everything, the database team, the server team, whatsoever, because we wanted to get to one definition of an application, which means that we, you need one team to deliver a service, and that team then needs to be multidisciplinary. So what were the core concepts that we used to, yeah, to, to explain to, to all our, uh, our employees to what they needed to be doing? First of all, the application should become self-contained. You don't want to stock your information in 10 different applications. This means the codes, the configuration, the, the modules that you need, but also things that are related, like database changes. If you deploy a new version and your database has to change, then why not store your database change scripts in your application? This means you can use it during the deployment, and via the deployment hooks, we can create one application deployment that does everything. We wanted to automate as much as possible, and with OpenShift v2, we saw that, okay, we couldn't reach 100% because security and network-related stuff, that is still for the operational guys. And we didn't have a lot of plug-in points or hooks in, uh, in OpenShift v2. So our aim was, okay, let's do those 95% that we can do with OpenShift, and we create a solution for the 5% the later. We set up that, uh, that solution with all those teams that I, I gave you uh, before. Let it be clear, in going to a platform as a service, it is not an infrastructure job. Because your uh, containers have a lot of aspects in them, they have and the code and the configuration, you will need the expertise of a lot of different teams. So you have to, to roll that out with all those teams involved, because otherwise they can't support that. We went for full traceability, because before we had uh, a lot of manual changes, manual changes that we couldn't really trace. And then if something was wrong, it's complicated because you don't know if there is a change, what was the change, and who did the change. So from the beginning, we went completely for personal accounts, and that was explicitly not for finger pointing, just to make sure you knew who did the change and you could ask them the reasons uh, for which they did that, and to look together to, to fix it. And because we had this personal accounts and this whole security model, again, like with the database changes, we were able to reuse this, this same security model with all the, um, the logging infrastructure that, that, that we had, which meant that based on the security model, you get an access to a, a certain application, and automatically you also have access to the centralized logs that it produces. So we really integrated this uh, platform as a service into our complete uh, infrastructure. Like I said, the standard solution with room for extension, that is important. We provided some uh, default hooks that, that the applications could reuse. But if they had specific needs, they could change them which on the one hand delivers us the flexibility, and again, it standardizes it, because everybody is doing his extension in the same way. They are using the same hooks. All the information about the extension point is also contained in the application. And then we took 
already in uh, the, the V2, the, um, the decision to make a multi-tenant setup, even if for V2 we did it only for one uh, business unit. That has learned us a lot about the complexity of creating a multi-tenant setup from the beginning, and you, as you will see further on, that uh, were lessons that were very valuable in uh, what is yet to come. So if we have a look, uh, we're now operational in production uh, for more than a year with, uh, with OpenShift V2. What can we say about platform as a service and OpenShift V2 um, as, a, as a whole? So we really learned that the auto idling really helps us increase our efficiency. If you look at the number of applications that we are now hosting in our development and test environments compared to the simple infrastructure as a service that we had before, we have a lot of more containers. And we are not using more resources, so we are very efficient. And we can give the message to our development teams, yes, you can create a container if you really want it. You don't have to justify every container that you create. You don't have to wait several weeks before all these other teams have uh, executed their, their stuff. And that means that a lot of tests that before we only were able to execute very late in the development flow, I'm thinking here, for example, to uh, cluster tests, that at the moment the people are doing them much earlier because they can create their clustered environment and they test with it two, three days, and when they have finished their, their test, they simply throw it away, which was something that we never did with uh, the traditional infrastructure because it was simply too, too costly. Also, scaled deployments, they really simplify your life. Before you, testing with the cluster, it was complicated. You had to know how to, how to do it. Now, whether you deploy to, to one gear, two gear, eight gear, it's the same command. So there, the, the platform really lowers the the learning curve for your developers to start using real clusters and real environments, which greatly improves your uh, quality of testing. We started to do this by rep for replacing our WebLogic, so we were looking at the JBoss application service. But at a certain time, some of the, the colleagues in-house, in they, they learned about this um, this project, and they said, yeah, well, but I'm doing PHP, and I'm, I'm doing static websites, and I have the same issues. I also need to have this environment, and yeah, can't you do it on the same, on the same infrastructure? And yes, we can, because this platform directly gives you the multiple technologies in the same interface, which also means that you are working to standardization on another level. At this moment, you can operate uh, a container without even knowing what type of technology is in it. And that is also very useful. About the process that, that, we, that we took, as I said, we took the decision to automate 95%, and in the perception of the people, at this moment, all the problems seem to move to the last 5%. So the aim should really be to to go the, the whole nine yards, you automate everything, or otherwise the people will still complain about it. Uh, and as we will see, OpenShift V3 is helping us there. The decision that we took to say, okay, let's take a basic uh, solution that you can extend yourself, there we got a lot of mixed uh, reactions to it. So there are a lot of people who really love it because they say, okay, this really is giving me the flexibility that I need. But some people, they really love straight answers. And they come to you and they say, okay, with this OpenShift, tell me, how do I do this? And when the answer is, well, it depends, and you can do it like this, but you can also do it like that. For some people, that is annoying. So you really have to, to look also at your uh, communication. Same thing in the process, now that we give the people the flexibility, it also means that they have more responsibility. Before they created the ticket, it went to the, to the expert, the expert is doing the configuration, and if he isn't happy with it, it blocks, it comes back. Now you have the flexibility to do the change yourself, but that doesn't mean that you don't have to inform the specialists, that you don't have to talk to them. 
And there are also some people who take the flexibility and let go the responsibility. So again, this is not uh, an installation of a product. Like I said, we were trying uh, to create a mind shift. So in fact, we are changing a culture and changing a culture does not happen overnight. It requires a lot of communication, a lot of trial and errors uh, sometimes just to get the, the development teams really embrace this change and start thinking differently about uh, the infrastructure on which they deploy. About the model that, that OpenShift offers as a platform, as a service, we're really happy about that. But what we learned already there is that being a shared service provider also requires some more or some other features than just being on-premise. So like I said, even in V2, because we knew what was coming, we started with a multi-tenant approach in mind, but it still isn't that easy. When you start connecting a lot of different networks, there are real challenges that, uh, that are there. OpenShift V2 did not have an answer for everything. OpenShift V3, we see the same, uh, the same situation at the moment. We are still lacking some essential features, but we are getting there. When you are changing the model, and especially in the multi-tenant way, security model, the security model that you map onto your product is really, is really key. If your security model is okay, you can use it like I, I showed you uh, with the centralized logging. You can also use it outside of the platform as a service and offer uh, one broad uh, view to um, computing for your development uh, teams, really not splitting application per application, but offering it as a service. So thinking about how you are going to, to map your business and your uh, security governance internally to the product is something that you should take a time. Uh, if once it is in place, it is, it's rather difficult to make major uh, adaptations. If you do it right, it really works very well. If you do it wrong, you're bothering the, the people. And also what we learned is that once you introduce something new, a new model like these containers, you will see that your pricing aspects become important because in our traditional infrastructure, we had some pricing model, which was based on how the infrastructure worked. Now these containers come along and some of the assumptions of the previous model were incorrect or were really um, penalizing some, um, some types of uh, some, some workloads. So if you are changing your model, you also have to look at the prices because in the end, it should not be three times more expensive because then your customers will also not go uh, and use your service. So that's in short our experiences with, uh, with OpenShift V2, but I think that uh, for the audience here, OpenShift V3 is more, more important. So let's say how we are looking to the migration from, from version two to, to version three. What we saw is OpenShift version 2, you can classify it as, let's say, a classic Linux box on steroids. Uh, you still have fixed IPs, uh, you have user groups that are really clear, you use the DNS. Those are all notions that your infrastructure team, they know that, they, um, they can handle that. It's not that much of, um, of a new world for them. If you're talking OpenShift V3, well, that's Docker, and it's not only Docker, but uh, it's, it's Docker on steroids. Um, you have this OpenShift layer, Kubernetes, that are coming into. They really need it because, let's be clear about that, the security model of Docker is really not suited for, for creating something that we are, are doing. Uh, we have the software-defined network that is, is coming along, and yes, that adds a lot of flexibility, but like we had to guarantee also network isolation, doing that with a, a software-defined network, that's hard. Now we have this routing layer, which means that we are using uh, the DNS differently than, uh, than we were doing in V2. So for our infrastructure teams, it was, uh, it was a learning curve, that was, that was clear. 
Uh, luckily, we already started in, in V2, and also during this complete process, um, our relationship with, uh, with Red Hat has, has evolved for quite a bit. So in V2, we were really a customer implementing a product like it, like it was. But with the experience that we, we gained there, we uh, yeah, went into version 3, so we are already some time in the, in the Commons uh, community. Thanks again for everybody who is giving us a lot of very appreciated details there over the, the last month. Um, and also now it's really more of a, of a partnership. Yeah? We're really working together uh, to reach our goals. And I think that is really needed to uh, to get uh, a major upgrade like OpenShift V3 uh, rolled out in a in a multi-tenant environment. So, where version two was really a big shift in the mindset for of our development teams. So, getting from this classic traditional infrastructure into containers. Um, at this moment, from V2 to V3, for the development teams, that's not big a change because they already have this uh, configuration externalized. They know what the container is, uh, is looking like, and they see the same concepts in V3. For your infrastructure teams, as said, V3 is a, is a bit more of a, of a challenge. One thing that we did see now that we're going from V2 to V3 is that Docker can be a bit overwhelming. So everybody is seeing in version three, well, it's based on Docker, so what can we do with Docker and what do we need to do and how do I create a Docker file and how do I link to Docker containers? Well, you don't. OpenShift is doing that to you. So we, we kind of had to curb the enthusiasm of some of the development teams because the Docker got some uh, unneeded attention and they were thinking that they had to change their complete way of developing which isn't the, the case. So let's have a look at, at what we, we really like in, in, in version three, if we compare it to, to version two, for example. So yeah, first of all, the packaging. Uh, like I said, in, in version two, if you wanted to do a, a binary deployment, like what we want to do in, a, in our uh, production environment, it wasn't really supported out, out of the box. So you had to, to create your proper, your proper um, deployment package yourself. We did a custom script for, uh, for that. We're really happy that now that is uh, standardized with, uh, with Docker, not only for us internally, but we even started to use Docker as kind of the interface of external software developers that they can uh, simply send us uh, applications developed locally at their site they send it in this, uh, this Docker container and we can introduce it to, to the platform without uh, having differences in, in deployment architecture. So that is really the standardization there is, is really helping us to, to accommodate a lot more different types of workloads on our, uh, on our system. Also, the Docker system is much faster in, in scaling. Uh, sometimes we, we had long waiting times due to the, the F-Sync that needed to copy all the, all the files from one key to, to another, so it's clear the packaging in V3 is uh, clearly superior. Also, the integration of, uh, of the metrics into the console and the action that you can do in the console, the, the logs that you can see there, it's a large difference. So in V2, operationally, the console was not really helping us. Uh, in V3, it, uh, it's really a, a very used tool. It's not only the web console that is uh, superior in V3, also the CLI, the, the new CLI OC, it's much cleaner and most of all, it's much faster than uh, the, the old one that we, we had in, in V2. Uh, and that is important because, um, yeah, we also use the, the CLI to, to integrate with, with some of our, our systems. So we really like that about the OpenShift V3 is that it is really open. Yeah. We can integrate everything that we already had existing, uh, our existing build systems, uh, our existing infrastructure. We can integrate it into OpenShift into the pipelines, and we can also extract a lot of data via the, the API that we can then re-inject into other systems, like for the capacity planning and, and such. Also, one of the big 
issues that we had with, with V2 were those gear types. So in V2, you had to specify your containers. Uh, then you had to lock that to, to a node. And if an application came with different uh, requirements, yeah, then you had to create a different node. So if you have uh, a small infrastructure and you are not yet scaled out, that sometimes was a bit of a, of a problem. You had to, to put your application into a gear type that was not really suitable for, uh, for the application, and you had to be creative. In version 3, the resource limits per, uh, per container or per, per deployment is much more flexible. It's, uh, it's well done. And if you still remember these, we, our aim was to automate 95% because we still had to, to handle security-related uh, stuff. Well, that in V3 is handled by the secrets. So the secrets allows us to uh, specify things like uh, passwords, uh, key stores, certificates, and, and things like that. We can store that in, in secrets, and there is a really nice security model that will make sure that only the, uh, the people with the proper credentials can, can see them. So um, all in all, V3 really brought us uh, a lot. It really fixes a lot of the uh, limitations that we saw with V2. There are also some things that are in OpenShift V3 that are a bit less useful for, for us. First of all, we don't use source to image, um, mainly because at our site we don't have a lot of uh, different programming languages that we need to support. Uh, so the auto detection feature is not that useful for us. And also the build pipelines in Jenkins, yeah, we already had that. We were used to them. We had a lot of quality uh, tools already in, installed. And the integration out of the box is at the moment not complete enough. We don't have the proper control that we, that we want. So at the moment, we are still building in our own infrastructure. But as I said, uh, OpenShift V3 really proves to be open about that. And we can very easily integrate it with uh, our existing build pipelines. Um, same goes for the automatic image updates. So we really like the idea about it. Uh, unfortunately, because we are in a um, multi-tenant setup, we can't use the, the actual uh, Docker registry because that is not a multi-tenant and is still lacking some um, some enterprise features. So we were uh, we are working with an external Docker registry and automatic image updates don't go very well with uh, with that one. And we also need to have fine-grained control of which triggers are executed at which moment. We can't simply have, okay, this image is rebuilt and now we are going to uh, redistribute it uh, everywhere. So the automatic image updates, we handle that also externally. And uh, again, there, uh, OpenShift V3 is open enough to, to enable that. And of course, as with every new product, we also see some, some room for improvement. So the network isolation at this moment, we, we were required to do uh, a rather large setup with a lot of nodes to, to get the network isolation uh, working. Uh, there also, we are working together with, uh, with Red Hat to, to look at uh, how they are fixing that in, in, in versions to come. So we're really confident that that will improve. Uh, Multi-tenant storage. Also an issue, if we can't handle the storage in a proper multi-tenant way, we can't offer the, the storage because we can't risk that one client is uh, accessing the data from, from others. Um, user namespaces, that is one where, yeah, at this moment, if you want to install um, Docker images that uh, are coming from externally, we really have to, to explain them. No, you can't be root because yeah, you have to, to think about the, about the security. So yeah, we, we have to do some, some education sometimes to, to, to tweak the, the images a bit. So we're really looking forward to the, the user namespaces when that comes and, uh, and that will make our life easier. And then the feature uh, that we really liked in, in V2 is the, is the auto idling and the auto wake up as I uh, mentioned before, in V2 that really allowed us to, to be more efficient in uh, our infrastructure. And routers for non-HTTP traffic would also be appreciated. So to, to conclude, as, a, as the title already said, it's a, a journey to platform as a service. So don't consider it an event. We install the product and everything is working. 
platform as a service as itself is a journey, and it's part of a, a bigger journey uh, that we are doing in the Belgian government, the G Cloud. So, in the end, that is really a complete solution from housing, bare metal servers, uh, hypervisors, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, everything um, will be available. And it's not only Small that is working on that initiative, but we are one of the of the partners. And uh, in the end, we will have a complete government cloud that can cater to, to, to every need. And specifically, uh, our infrastructure team is at the moment uh, setting up the infrastructure as a service uh, cloud with OpenStack. And yeah, what, what we see there is, is, is really those two are coming together. And the line between them is, is sometimes even starting to blur. Uh, you can do the same uh, action in the infrastructure as a service with everything that's in OpenStack, or you can do it in, a, in OpenShift. Again, we, we are gaining uh, flex more flexibility there, which is uh, always a good thing. So that's actually uh, maybe a great place to start doing some Q&A here, uh, Jeff, because there's a lot of questions coming in. And um, I'm actually quite thrilled to see that you're, you're setting up OpenStack, too, as we're heading for OpenStack Summit soon. So we'll, we'll steal you and, and get you to talk about that story um, uh, running OpenShift on OpenStack um, in the not too distant future. But um, there are a couple of people, if you look in the chat, and we'll probably, uh, Aresh just asked, and I think it's a good way to start, um, is your current OpenShift environment deployed on bare metal or on VMs? He's guessing bare metal, but I think you said it was um, uh, a virtualized environment, and and he asked the question about OpenStack, which you answered for him. But there was, was that, a, that question, um, where is it deployed? And a couple of questions about the size of your OpenShift cluster and the, you know, the volume of transactions. So if you could give them a sense of that, that would be probably a good place to start with the Q&A. Okay, so no, we are uh, deployed on virtual machines, and the main reason for that is the network isolation. So um, at this moment, the network isolation, if you want to support uh, traffic that is coming out of OpenShift and that is going into your legacy network, to be able to define from where it is coming, you can't mix the, um, the containers from different uh, tenants. So, which means that our nodes are created as uh, VMs to get all the isolation per tenant and per environment, because we also can't mix the traffic from production and, and development uh, environments uh, for that. So, clearly, once the network isolation is complete, because in the 3.1 there is all, already a lot of uh, improvement of the network isolation, but once the um, the feature is implemented completely. Yes, we are aiming at the bare metal uh, installation, but at the moment the VMs are there to, to handle the, uh, the network isolation. Um, as the size of our cluster at the, the moment with, with V2, we have uh, about 50 applications in, in production, and if you take all the environments uh, about it, it's uh, about Three, four hundred containers, something, something like that. Um, with the OpenShift V3, clearly we are aiming, aiming bigger. So the V2 was only for for one business unit to to get acquainted with uh, with it. So there we are talking about uh, a couple of thousand uh, containers. So we are not, yeah, we're clearly not a uh, not Google, um, but we're also not a, a really small enterprise neither. So. So there, there's, there's another question here too, and, and um, a lot of people ask questions about um, the migration path. Um, there's a question about um, what was the migration project process for going from WebLogic to OpenShift and how painless or painful was that? And how is your migration from OpenShift V2 to V3 going? Yeah, so the, the migration from, from WebLogic to, to JBoss was, um, Quite challenging, uh, but let's say let's say that, um, because we were changing a lot of things at the, at the same time. So because OpenShift was based on on Git, we did a subversion to Git uh, migration. Then the WebLogic 10 to to JBoss that really meant that we we had to to um, um, 
yeah, they, they take a leap. It was a change of the Java version of the Java EE version. Uh, nearly all of our uh, libraries changed. So, um, yeah, if you change a lot of your libraries, a lot of things that simply worked, um, stop working. <laughs> it's uh, standardization on, on an application server level, it, it's, not, it's not perfect. Yeah, you, you see that if you start doing that, you have things that work with one specific version of a library. Maybe it was a, an error there, and now you change it with a, with a newer version. I don't really think that it's the, the migration from WebLogic to, to JBoss. If we would have done from one WebLogic version to another, we would have had uh, very similar problems. The main thing that, that you need to do if you're going from a traditional infrastructure to, to containers is you want to have your containers, like I said, to be self-contained and exactly the same in all environments. So we couldn't allow changing the, the artifacts in the, in the containers image, even though in, in version 2 it was not really an image like it is in Docker. But we really stressed from the beginning, it should be the, the artifact that is built in development that goes into production. So that means that everything that you still had in descriptor files that you changed in manually or via a Maven build, yeah, you have to externalize that um, so that you can add it next to, to the image. So that was the main, the main mind that that, uh, that the developers had to had to take, uh, which honestly was one that we were really happy about because before, yeah, it was sometimes also complicated to see where is it configured because you had a lot of descriptors and now with everything externalized in the self-contained application, all the environment relevant uh, configuration is is, um, is in one place. Applications that already did that migration. So that have this, this configuration externalized, they migrate really well to, to OpenShift V3 because you take the, the base image for, uh, for the JBoss container and all the, the configuration, yeah, you simply store it in a, store it in a secret and it, 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 works the, it works the same way. So really my, my, uh, my feeling is that version two was, was really or coming from uh, a traditional infrastructure to containers, yes, that is taking some um, developer effort. Once you are in a containerized system, it doesn't really matter what type of container you're, you're in, because you already have the data in the, in the proper places. All right, and there was, um, Aresh asked another question here, which I think I'm trying to get through some of the quicker questions. Um, are you using IPv6? No. I didn't think so. Um, and uh, Mark, uh, who is one of my friends here with the in the identity management space, uh, is asking for some more details on how you're managing access to the projects. For instance, how do you make sure that only authorized developers and admins have access? Do your customers have access? How are you authenticating them? Given that your customer is government, what kind of regulations do you have to deal with from an authentications requirement, i.e. audit requirements, multi-factor authentication? Um, can you speak to that at all? Yeah, so uh, for the developers, um, authentication, we don't need uh, two-factor and, and, and things like that. That is mainly used for our, uh, yeah, our applications themselves. They clear, clearly have that, and in Belgium we have a, a very nice uh, identity card, which is, a, which is a smart card, so we do a lot of... Uh, um, integration with that uh, Belgian uh, EID. Um, with the, the development teams, because we are an in-house pro provider, for um, nearly all of them we, we have trusted network zones, circle, circle of trust and things like that. Uh, so we don't need the, um, the two-factor authentication at that level. It's more who can access and who can make changes to a production environment, who can't. And so it's, it's more the, the proper mapping of the, the roles, the access roles, that, is, uh, that was the, the challenge, then really changing the, the, the standard authentication mechanisms offered by, uh, by OpenShift. Cool. All right, and there is one more question here from Aresh, um, and it probably goes back to, what we talked about last week with service catalogs and service linkings, or the week before last, 
Um, are you planning to build an app catalog with OpenShift for your e-government customers? Uh, yes. So, um, but not specifically for OpenShift, but the, the aim is even more to have one service catalog for the complete cloud. Uh, so that clearly is something that we still need to uh, still need to address. Um, at the moment, the main focus is on getting these custom-built applications on the on the platform. Uh, these types of applications they don't really need to be in a in a catalog. Uh, it's more the the software as a service offerings that 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 we see that that we want to to be able to offer them in the catalog and then directly deploy them either uh, on the infrastructure as a service as, a, as an expanded VM, or if we can create that as a, as a container directly into, uh, into OpenShift. All right. Well, I think that might be, I'm giving them a minute, another few seconds to type in more questions in the chat, but um, I am uh, incredibly impressed at the depth of the work that you've done around OpenShift and going from V2 to V3, and I'm looking forward, as I said, to your journey to OpenStack as well. So that'll be um, another interesting um, story and hearing about those integrations. And uh, I um, am quite grateful for you to take the time today um, to be with us, Jeff. So um, we hope to have you again soon. And um, all of the things that you are asking um, about V3 um, and looking for are all things that are in the Trello boards. Um, I've seen every one of those as a topic and are being worked on at various by various groups of people. Um, and so if people want to look at them or comment them, they can look at the Trello boards for OpenShift and um, and add to their add to the, the commentary and the use cases that are there. But this was, um, as everyone's saying in the chat, a, a great presentation and we're really Thankful for you sharing your insights and I look forward to having more in the future. So thanks, Jeff. Okay. Thank you for having me. All right. Take care. Have a great day.